as above, so below. <laughs> Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am Bernard Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist. I do psychotherapy and more and more synchronicity, meaningful coincidences. And today, Godwinks have helped people psychologically, interpersonally, uh, and spiritually. And we're going to have a good time today talking about one of the foremost people writing about, talking about, expressing about meaningful coincidences under the term Godwinks. And many of you know that term already. If you want to get my new book, you can get it at any bookstore or the link below. Uh, and I'm going to tell my story today. And it's about uh, a person I know named Madison, ch name changed, a, a, a middle, middle-aged white teacher who was in the midst of grieving the loss of a well-loved black colleague's young daughter who was suddenly on a respirator due to a brain aneurysm as madison had a dream in which she was holding a black baby boy with a cute afro wearing a bright blue pajamas at that time she found out later that as she was dreaming her colleague's daughter died that morning, as she walked in her neighborhood, an unknown man came up to her. I love these stories of unknown people starting to talk to you. Uh, it's like, that's where stuff happens. Uh -huh. And told her that his daughter, his daughter, the unknown man's, was also named Madison, and she had just had a baby boy. The new grandfather handed Madison a bright blue lollipop, the color of the baby's pajamas, in her morning dream. <laughs> Somehow she lost the lollipop uh, and she kept wondering about hope for the future with the death of this child of her friend. Uh, but maybe that hope would move to this new child, she wondered. Later that day, she walked the streets listening to a meditation about being progressively positive. She looked down and there was that lost lollipop. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this coincidence spurred her on for hope for the future well the guy you heard smiling and laughing behind this is a big-hearted coincidence guy who's coined the term god winks uh, he's a former abc network executive and was one of the fathers of ABC's Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> injunction, Remember? injunction, what's your function? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll get the jailhouse rock. rock. <laughs> Warden found a weather and led Morning America to number one. I mean, his, this guy's been on ABC for a while and done a great great job in getting people to pay attention to what they're doing now squire is known as the godwink guy he coined a new word for those little experiences that feel coincidental but come from divine sources godwinks has entered the english language and other languages and appears in dictionaries he's a new york times best-selling author with 12 Godwinks books and has sold more than 2 million copies in 30, 30, 30 languages. He and his wife, Louise, are story writers and executive producers of the top-rated Hallmark Godwink movie series, now entering its fifth season. These are stories where you have movies about people experiencing these very meaningful coincidences called Godwinks. They also wrote the story and executive produced the recent Netflix movie Rescued by Ruby, which premiered at number one 
in the world and in 2022 was ranked as Netflix best third best movie of the year. For five seasons, Squire has hosted Godwinks on NBC today, and it's one of the most streamed segments. Hey, Squire, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Bernie. It's a delight to be here with you. It's a delight to be with you. I mean, I read a lot of your books and made notes. Uh, and one of the one of my favorite ones is the two people 3,000 miles away or 2,000 miles away, uh, not wanting to get together but afraid to. And then they both end up reading the same passage from the same book. Oh, uh, yes, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. And, but th then the then the minister reads the same passage too. Uh, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And that's a uh, that's <laughs> some of your what we used to call far out and groovy ones, Squire. Uh, you got a bunch. <laughs> you got a bunch of them. Uh, so, just so our audience gets to know you a little bit better, tell us one of your favorite uh, uh, Godwink stories. Well, let me tell you one of my, uh, this is always in the hit parade uh, uh, after 20 years. And it was one of the first Godwinks that <clears throat> somebody mailed to me. <clears throat> Actually, it was the husband of the uh, the subject who is, her name is Stacia, Stacia Kelly. Stacia Kelly at the time was about 23 years old. She was working in Denver and she got a call in the middle of the night that her father had died of a heart attack. She was just devastated. She quickly packed a bag, threw some things into it, some memorabilia, ran to the airport, got uh, the ticket and the morning paper, climbed into her window seat and uh, just felt so devastated by what was going on. She she just felt lost and, and, and unconnected. And she opened up that newspaper and there was her father's picture on the front page. Emmett Kelly, world's most famous clown, dead at 80. And she just saw that sad, sad face of the clown who was with the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Burley, Barley, uh, Barley, Ringling Brothers. Barnum and Barley. Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> For 20 years, he was with Ringling Brothers. And, and he was the sad clown with the sad face, little hobo clown with a sad face. And he had always uh, made this pact with everybody that he worked with and certainly his family knew it. Never get caught in a shot, uh, a picture with anything but that trademark sad face. And he did great, except for that one time. He was being interviewed by a UPI photographer and the, the, the interview was interrupted by a phone call. And so he, he turned around and he answered the phone and, and it was the doctor. Emmett, congratulations. You're the father of a new baby girl. He grinned from ear to ear and the photographer went click. And the next day, that picture went around the globe. And it was the only picture of the sad faced clown smiling. Stacia, for whatever reason, had thrown that old newspaper into her bag that morning. She reached down and she pulled it out. And there it was, the only picture of her father caught smiling. But in that moment, she had, she had, a, uh, she had a, a, an awareness that she never had before. What her father was smiling at. He was smiling about her. And she began to cry. There was a man seated next to her. He leaned over and he said, Miss, are you okay? And she, 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 she got the words out. She pointed to the picture and she said, Yes, my father died last night. He looked astonished. His eyes widened. He said, you're not going to believe this. I'm the photographer who took that picture 25 years ago. And you can't imagine how excited your father was that day. At that moment, a peace that defied all understanding overcame Stacia Kelly. And a few weeks later, and actually a few months later, she selected that photographer to take the pictures at her wedding.
became a lifelong friend. That's how God winks work in each one of our lives. The incredible coincidental events that come together and when they are divinely uh, inspired, that's what I call a God wink. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, and being as I'm one of those scientific guys who takes things apart. Uh -huh, <laughs> good. Um, the, <clears throat> I'd sent my book to uh, an LA Times reporter, my current book, Meaningful Coincidence. And she didn't know what to do with it. So one day, uh, she was going to meet a friend for dinner, and she put the book in her purse to have something to read. Now, she gets a lot of books. She writes a column with a lot of books. Mm -hmm. And she goes to dinner, meets a friend of hers, uh, and introduces the friend to a, a public who, uh, who who is a reporter of uh, the foreign reporter for the LA Times, who was looking for someone to hire. And it turned out that the person that the rep my reporter was meeting also was looking for a job. So they fit it together. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a nice coincidence for them. Mm -hmm. And she pulled out from her purse, my book and said, this is a coincidence that really gets to me. So I'm going to write the story about the book. <laughs> That was an affirmation. Yeah, that was an, that was an affirmation. Yeah. And, and, and the, the putting Stacia putting the photograph in her purse. Yeah. Uh, is similar to what this reporter did. She didn't usually do that. Sure. Either of them. Yeah. So so when I take these apart, I wonder what is it that motivates from your perspective a person to make a decision to put the whatever we're talking about the purse the photograph uh the book in the purse and uh, then go out with it and then meet uh, a major um, godwink or coincidence yeah well in as the godwink thesis has evolved in in my journey um i uh, I became aware of another force that was taking place that preceded uh, coincidences or God winks. And I call that divine alignment. That somehow or other, we are all divinely aligned on paths. We're nudged along by inner instincts, mysterious instincts to do something or to be somewhere and to end up at the right place at the right time. We have all had the experience where we 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 were at a place that we were not usually uh, intended to be, or where we may have even taken a different route to get there. But by that experience, we happen to be there not five minutes early, not five minutes too late, but right on time to encounter someone who turns out to be maybe our future wife or our future husband, or maybe the person who says, hey, there's a job available, or you you got a whole new career going, or there's some kind of an event that I believe comes from God that he wants you to encounter, and you are divinely aligned to be there. And when you look on a long camera at, at the threads of divine alignment, that somebody is coming along and you're coming along and you happen to be at that right place at the right time, there's always a God wink there. Now, the distinction between a coincidence and a God wink, I think, is kind of important for where I have evolved. Yeah. This, yeah. Because in the beginning, when I, when I, uh, my fascination was, was just me meaningful coincidences and, um, <clears throat> and the, I wasn't, uh, <clears throat> I didn't read your book 20 years early, but uh, it, it was uh, coincidences that really meant something. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but uh, I, my first book was called When God Winks, The Power, uh, How the Power of Coincidence Guides Your Life. So mm -hmm. in my view, 
Godwinks was simply another term for what coincidence was. Mm-hmm. But and and the reason that that came about is that very often when I was in my beginning stages of researching this and talking to people about coincidences in their lives, uh, people would say, "Well, I, I don't really think it was a coincidence," but I, I you know, so then and I started asking, "Well, if there's no coincidence to coincidence, what do you call it?" And so I started realizing that in those cases, they were connecting it to something that was divine. And so that's where Godwinks then evolved. And that word came into my mind. It just seemed to perfectly describe what it was that I was trying to communicate. Uh, when it did come into mind, I thought, gee, there are other words out there, out there like Godsend, Godspeed. <clears throat> These are fun little words. God wink. It sounds like a fun little word. I'm a TV guy by nature, and so um, so I always try to be on that on that on that fence between the secular and the non secular, and uh, and so God wink. I thought maybe would 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 skirt past the attention of producers who didn't like the God word. <laughs> I was I was very wrong, by the way. I, I ran Good Morning America. But uh, but for eight years, they turned me down because they said, tell Squire we love him, but we hate the title of his book, that G-O-D word, you know. And so anyway, uh, that's how in the beginning, the, the word Godwink became a distinct. But I thought it was an interchangeable word with coincidence. And then as I um, had more and more dialogue with, with my readers, um, um, they would give me little. They would give me little hints. They they would say, uh, "I believe that God winks happen when you allow them to happen." And I thought, "Well, yes, that's true. I think that is true. I think that's that's substantiated by the stories that I'm hearing." Well, if you have to allow them, that means that you have to open yourself up to to some other force, some other uh, some other origin for them to come to you. And so that therefore supported the divine uh, origination of Godwinks. And so, and then I <clears throat> I finally read it and I, I looked it up in the dictionary. I never had, had done that, looked up coincidence in the dictionary. And, and it said, basically, two extraordinary events that come together without a cause. Well, I thought, well, that's not what a Godwink is. Uh, a Godwink is with a cause, and that cause is divine. So that's when I realized that Godwinks was actually filling a hole in the language, that that a hole that was not satisfied by the word coincidence. And so uh, that's and and that that both were very uh, very appropriate to the language. I could honestly see where in the world of science, coincidence, without that G-O-D word, uh, that, that, that that would fill that, that, that need in the language, but that Godwink was filling an entirely different need, but on a parallel path. And then when I discovered that the Hebrews, in the Hebrew language, coincidence doesn't even exist, I thought, well, they had something in mind that uh, that we never thought of, and if it didn't exist, why not? And I talked to a few rabbis and people who were knowledgeable, and they said, "Well, if God is sovereign, what do you need coincidence for?" Well, you need it because the scientists need that word. I think that needs to describe two events that come together without an apparent cause. And so, I think in that whole discussion, uh, it it. Um, uh, it evolved into uh, a fascinating part of the whole Godwink thesis. I use the word meaningful coincidence to uh, get away from the neutrality of the word coincidence. Mm -hmm. uh, Godwinks uh, does it a lot better uh, and it, it suggests the cause <clears throat> right there in the term, the explanation. Yeah. Uh, my tendency has been to try to 
look at the multiple variables that go into creating a coincidence, which includes uh, the person's own decision making. The, the person has some agency in making uh, a God wink take place, I think. Yes. You have you the right place, right time one that you yes. so clearly yes. described in my survey of meaningful coincidences. That's one of the top four most common coincidences mm -hmm. that I get to the right place at the right time without planning. And we tune into something called intuition, which is a vague thing, but somehow we know things without knowing how we know them. And so it, you can say that you're guided by God when you make a decision to put your father's photograph in the purse uh, on, the, on that trip. Mm -hmm. Or you can say you're picking up something, and some would say precognitively that you are going to meet somebody with whom that's going to be a good uh, connection. The overall idea of God and divinity cannot be argued with. Uh, once you say that this is divinely inspired, there is no argument with that because there is no argument about the first cause and God is the first cause. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm trying to do is, is investigate some of the details of the mind of God in, uh, in, in figuring out what we have to do with it, uh, what we call randomness has to do with it. And I like to emphasize, as a therapist, our own personal responsibility in making some of these things happen. What do yeah. you think of personal responsibility as part of creating a God wink? Well, I think that that falls right in line with one of the other principles that um, that um, I've evolved out of. There were like seven or eight principles that um, are pretty consistent with God winks, and one of them, <clears throat> and again, came from from one of the readers, is and that is is that when we step out in faith, step out of our comfort zone step into a direction, like stepping onto a pathway, heading for what we believe to be our destiny, then God winks happen. And they happen more frequently. And so I often say, don't sit by the edge of the road on your baggage, waiting for God winks or coincidence to come to you. Get off your baggage, leave it behind, get on the highway, heading for what you believe to be your destiny and God winks will unfold just as certainly as when you get on the highway and you see the road signs that show you that you're on the right path. Now, they don't tell you where to go. Those, those signs don't say go to New York or go to Boston. They just reaffirm that the decision that you made to get on that highway that you're that you, they're, they're just a reaffirmation along the way and i believe that that's what god winks are god winks are signposts along your path to reaffirm that the, that you're on the right track and and i often talk about it as uh, uh the first thought that came to me when god wink came into mind was um you know when we were children sitting at the big table maybe for the first time Thanksgiving or Christmas. And we sat there at the big table, not the little table off in the corner, but at the big table with all the adults. And we felt a little uncertain. We felt a, a, certainly out of place, uh, but it was kind of exciting too. And somewhere in that process, we might have looked up and somebody that we loved gave us a secret communication a little wink, maybe it was granddad, maybe it was mom or dad, but we never said, what do you mean by that? We knew it meant, hey kid, I see you. Hey kid, I'm thinking about you and I'm proud of you and, and I'm, I'm here next to you. And I thought that is the metaphor for a God wink. It is God saying, hey kid, I'm thinking of you right now. I'm letting you know that I'm, I've got my eye on you. And so that to me is kind of the 
the, 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 the comfort kind of communication, but it always, it always takes an, an initiative. Well, I shouldn't say it always takes an initiative by us because sometimes God winks happen when we're just, we are sitting by the edge of the road and, and twiddling our thumbs, but they more often happen when we leave the comfort zone and, and make a step out in faith that we're going somewhere where we haven't been, taking a different route, talking to somebody that we haven't talked to before, and uh, and 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 God winks happen. There's a, there's a great little story about that, <clears throat> if I can tell it. And I, I, I'm going to do a little advertising right here in the middle of your sure. before your story. Okay. You're you're singing my song here, Squire, because one of the ways I tell people don't lie there in bed looking at the ceiling for a thousand dollar bill. You got to get out and do something. And one of my fun ways of saying it, the, the dog that trots about finds a bone. You got to keep <laughs> there you moving. Go. You've got it. And I love what you're saying. You you've got to keep moving because hmm. what a coincidence is is the intersection of two events. Yes. So you've got to be doing something out there to have an event, uh, another event hit you. Now you can be sitting at the side of the road and get hit with something yeah. that happens because yeah. somebody yeah. else is looking for you and there's two people involved with it. But the yeah. basic idea is leave the structure behind and yeah. go on the adventure. And additionally, we we correlate and they are signposts. They are not commands. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, they are never commands. In fact, I learned that in the first speech that I ever gave about my first God Winks book, When God Winks. And um, it happened, happened to be on a cruise one of the I, and, and uh, my wife was an entertainer and so I came along as the extra baggage and I, I got booked as a speaker so <laughs> and so I was giving my first speech about Godwinks to an audience that was didn't know me had no connection at all to me. And as I looked at the schedule on one of those cruise uh, ships, you know, it looks like the deli, the Carnegie deli in New York. It's about this big and it's got a thousand things on it. And that was the day's activities. And somewhere in that list was author Squire Rushnell, new book, When God Winks. And I thought nobody's gonna show up. And my biggest competition was not the line dancing and it wasn't even the, uh, the, the, the bingo with the big pot. It was sunshine. It was the first sunshine day that they had. And so anyway, there I was at two o'clock in the afternoon and I was surprised that the place filled up. It filled about, um, you know, 7,500 people. And so at the end of that, a young woman came up to me and she was wide-eyed. She, she was really connected with Godwinks. And she, she thought, this is really the message that she needed to hear. And she said, can I talk to you? And I realized very quickly that I was in over my head, Ernie. I was in your business, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Give Advice to Human Beings. And, uh, and she said, there's this guy. And I, I know, I know that this is a Godwink. And, and, and what she wanted was confirmation that the Godwink was saying, you should marry the guy or keep on chasing the guy or whatever it was. And I realized right then and there that I needed to evaluate what these signposts were. And as I kept thinking about it, talking about it, praying about it, I came to the conclusion that they were just that. They were signposts of encouragement. They were not definitive directions that came via some divine source that said, you should marry the guy or take the job or any of those things. That is one of the most popular posts on my Psychology Today blog. Uh, do all these coincidences mean it's meant to be? And a lot of people do just what she was doing, that this is God inspired and we are meant to be together. And what ends up happening a lot is they use the coincidences that started them 
as the momentum to continue the relationship when they forgot about they got to work on the relationship to make it happen. That's right. And that gets missed. That gets missed. So you, you're, you're just popping up with, with a, so many parallels with what I'm doing here, Squire. They're kind of like, get out of your comfort zone. It's suggestions. It doesn't mean it's got to be. It's maybe mean you're on the right right path. I think it's, it's it confirms for me, listening to you, we've both been studying this stuff for quite a while, that uh, mm -hmm. we're studying the same thing from a different part of the elephant. Uh, yeah. And, and and it's so it's encouraging for me to hear you saying uh, what I've written uh, and but what you've written, too. Yeah, and right. it, so there's something here that the world needs to know something about much more. Yeah. You are getting it out there. Uh, you yeah. are a coincidence ambassador. You get our, you, you get our, our sticky badge on your hat. Oh, you wouldn't put it on your hat, <laughs> but you get it on your shirt. Um, yeah. That you're part of what the coincidence project is doing as are many other people, but there's uniqueness in your way of doing it because you're a media guy and have been for a long time and are getting a lot of these ideas out there. And so uh, I, I, that's part of the reason I appreciate being able to talk with you. But even more, I want to see where we have some more overlap. So I interrupted you. You were going to tell you a story. You were going to tell a story about if you Oh, yeah, we were going to a story about divine alignment. <clears throat> there is a, uh, there's a, there, uh, well, you know, everybody probably remembers uh, A&E biography shows. And they were, they were like number one on uh, A&E channel. And then in their own wisdom, they decided, well, that belongs on a channel of its own. So we'll take it off of A&E &E and we'll put it over here on a channel that has no viewers and hope everybody will come to it. <clears throat> we don't hear about those biographies anymore, do we? Anyway, there was a production company um, that uh, produced a lot of those. And Oftentimes you just find a fascinating personality and uh, and then you'd go pitch it to A and E and you'd and uh, and they they'd say, okay, well, okay, let's do that. Well, the the producer had uh, said, uh, let's let's uh, do a biography of uh, Peter Fabergé. Peter Fabergé was the jeweler. A designer who way back in history had created these beautiful eggs all out of jewelry. And each one was distinctively different and they were worth thousands of dollars. And, um, and so the czar of Russia, it was back when they had a czar, and, uh, and uh, he would always buy one of these Fabergé eggs for his wife. It would be specially designed. So Today, those Fabergé eggs, uh, uh, you know, at, uh, at Sotheby's and other places, they go for 10 million, 15 million, whatever they are. So, and so that was kind of the catch of getting the, the pickup for this one hour biography series. Well, so um, the producer came back and he handed it off to the head producer, a researcher, Debbie. And, um, this was pre-internet, pre-Google. And so you had to do it the old fashioned way. You had to really research and uh, go to the library and What's that? read books, <laughs> stuff like that. And so she was stuck. She couldn't find a single pathway that would take her to Peter Fabergé or any subsequent uh, relative. And so she was just frustrated. She had gone through eight weeks of time and she knew the clock was running and she was going to be a failure and they weren't going to be able to deliver the show. So <clears throat> she talked to her husband, who happened to be my trademark attorney, which is how I got the story. And he said, listen, I'm going to a, a law conference in, uh, in England. Uh, why don't you and Kate, their, their teenage daughter, why don't you and Kate just come along with me? Just, just get your mind off of it, okay? And so uh, she said, well, 
I, I don't know what else to do. I can't, I don't, yeah, okay. So she and Kate were having a wonderful time. They were all over London doing all kinds of things. And on the last day, <laughs> on the last afternoon, yeah, <laughs> um, Kate was still full of energy and her mother said, ah, oh, we, we just have to go back to the hotel. I just have to rest. And she said, oh, come on, mom, come on, mom. We're going to go down this uh, alley, this Burlington Arcade. I don't know what that is, but let's just go down this. This That sounds like fun. Anyway, it was all filled with these charming little itty bitty shops, very upscale kinds of things. And so they went into this little shop and they were looking at this and looking at that. And they found one thing they thought they could afford to take home with them. And so they got into line and they're chit chatting back and forth and about their trip and so forth. And behind them was a gentleman with a cane and a bowler, very <laughs> dapper fellow. And so he said, it sounds like you are Americans. And they turned around and they said, oh, great. And so they shook hands with them. They introduced themselves and they talked to this strange gentleman and they had a wonderful little chap until finally the line moved forward. Oops, excuse me, I'm using my hands too much. And the line moved forward and they they had to move forward. And so they said, well, it's awfully, it's awfully nice to, to, to meet you. And, um, uh, and so then and I, that was when they introduced themselves. She said, I'm Debbie Supnick from Los Angeles. She says, well, I'm, I, I'm uh, Theodore Fabergé. She's for fa 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 Fabergé? Are you kidding? And so that was a grandson to the Fabergé, you know, dynasty. And that was the pathway that it took for them to to, to be able to get all the information they need, all of the research they needed to be able to deliver the show and have that documentary on the air. Now, stepping out in faith, doing the thing that was not comfortable. It was divine alignment, being in the right place at the right time, and God winks happen. And when I when when I do divine alignment, and there is something going on around here, Squire, that ain't <laughs> that we don't know what it is. There's a mystery going on around here. Oh, it is. And uh, yeah. th that mystery has something to do with what happens in our lives for sure. And I know that, but I I also like to see where we have something to do with it. And that and th this story is the frustration uh the the luck that they went along with your suggestion and th this last day thing is not an uncommon theme either yeah. at the last oh, moment yes 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 and yeah. and it, it it and particularly having a child or a younger person drag the older person along uh -huh. with it because the kid has more tuned in to how things are are working and those are all part of what I think are human capacities to be able to find what we need without knowing how we get there. Mm -hmm. I call that human GPS that mm -hmm. we have in us the ability to track our environment and get to where we need to be, but not knowing how we're getting there or even what's going to happen. But we have the image in our mind about what need to happen this time. Find a Fabergé, five, find a Fabergé. That's, so that I break it down uh, uh, into, well, yes, there's a, a there's a lot going on that is mystery that is influencing us, but we tune into it. We have to be able to say, I want to go along with this. And that's what you're referring to as divine alignment. And because I'm, I'm a more of a scientist in this direction, I break stuff down more and mm -hmm. try to see that we have capacities, human GPS. It happens at the end at times of transition that's when a lot of these coincidences take place also. And there, that was the end of the trip. And you know that from what you've been able to describe. So that, that it's, it's so much fun hearing what you say. And then I put my detailed yeah. imprint on it. I, uh, love, that. I love that. It's the same. It's, it's the same phenomenon because we're looking at the same things, yes. but, but we bring to it different filters from our own past experience mm -hmm. you have somewhere in you a, a religious a beingness and that's in you it comes out through your heart and your mind and that's a filter that you go through 
and resonates so well with so many different people. And I have this, um, I went to medical school. I liked chemistry. You know, I did that stuff. You did, you, you've been out there uh, talking to the general public, which I really need to do more. And I am hoping that somehow you can help me get what I have out mm-hmm. in the, with that is a correlate with you. So it, it mm-hmm. becomes like God and science working I together that. sure. because that's what we have to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. It, it's the, it's the methods of science. The aim of religion is what I'm involved with is to find out more about how God works using uh, what we use, what we call our scientific methods. I think that's great. That's fabulous. And you know, when you're talking about how these things happen at the last minute in the last day in the last hour, that of course is very uh, faith related. I mean, people always talk about God always never works in the in the first hour. He always works in the eleventh hour, usually the fifty ninth minute of the eleventh <laughs> hour. That's when God comes through, and that and He's and of course, from a faith point of view, it, it is we need to call upon our faith for us to keep enduring and to not. Uh, distrust our faith to be able to keep pushing forward and count on the fact that God is going to be there and bring us through in the 11th hour. That's uh, it's so consistent uh, <clears throat> with for the way I'm thinking. That's not, mm-hmm. that's, it's, it's the persistence. It's yeah. the belief. It's the confidence. It's the kind of, it's going to work out kind yeah. of belief if i keep going because if i do, if i stop it's not uh, uh, that's what's going to happen it's going to stop no yeah. you also mentioned the human gps i actually talk about the gps god's positioning system <laughs> and what, what uh, let's talk uh, let's talk about uh, so god is positioning us you mean yeah yeah that he's the navigator and we're we're just uh, we're we're just down a pathway, and and how do you how do you how do you get the navigator to take you where you want to go? Well, you have to program it. You have to program it by communicating with the navigator, and of course that comes to another thesis uh, of of mine, and that is the second meaning in the dictionary for what a God wink is. It's not just one of those experiences that feels coincidental but comes from divine origin. The second meaning is another word for answered prayer. Yeah. And, and that, again, came from my readers. I have I found people writing to me, and they said, well, I prayed about this, and then I had a God wink. Well, I prayed about this, and I had a God wink. Well, that dawned on me that there is no word in the English language for answered prayer. And there was another vacancy in the language that Godwink was filling. It was not only not filling, uh, not only the the uh, inadequacy of coincidence to fill the need of something that came from a divine source, a coincidence that comes from a divine source. And so the Godwink filled filled that need, but also the need for a word that uh, so you don't have to say, "Well, I just had my prayer answered." Well, that's a long thing to say. You could say, I just had a God wink. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you have, you're such a, it's just, you're such a good get out there with the public uh, explaining stuff in, in ways that people can grab. Uh, I come from a kind of too much uh, detail kind of thing. Uh, and you, th- that's, a, a God wink is also a prayer answered. Now you mm-hmm. you had a great story uh, about a snow in uh, El Paso or something uh, that uh, was McAllen, Texas. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that was that really showed how there was a connection between prayer and God winks. And uh, <clears throat> my wife and I were doing a speech in uh, McAllen, Texas. I'd never been there. And if you don't know where McAllen, Texas is, if you think of that T 
tail of Texas, and you think of the very bottom of it on the Mexican border, um, that's McAllen, Texas. Next to Brownsville. And, yeah, it's, 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 it's not the most uh, southernmost community in Texas, but it's about almost the, the most. And so uh, a cold day in uh, McAllen, Texas in the middle of winter is 75. You know, so anyway, David Espinoza, who is about 50, married to Tony uh, Espinoza, both good Catholic families, and they um, uh, they had a crisis in the family. David had gone to the heart doctor and then he went to another one and another one. And they all confirmed that he had a, a very difficult heart problem uh, and um, and that his heart was only operating at 10% of its capacity and that he needed to have a heart transplant or he wouldn't survive. Well, they, they still doubted that. So they made an appointment up in Houston, five hours up the road at the DeBakey Heart Institute. And, um, and they did a whole battery of tests and they came out and said, yes, you need a heart transplant, David, but here's the Here's the hard part. Uh, we have to put this heart transplant, we have to transplant it within three hours. And then, um, and I'm not sure that that's the same as it is today, but when this story took place, that was what the, the rules were. And uh, you live five hours away. And, uh, and it's also going to be a long time. There's a long list here. So anyway, they went back to McAllen, not filled with hope. They were filled with disappointment and fear and uncertainty. We always fear uncertainty. So Tony did what she does best. She gathered together people to pray. Pray that, that David could get a heart donor. Pray that her husband would live because he had a heart donor. And they, she got everybody going. She got the church going. She got the neighbors going. She got the family going. And everybody was praying to beat the band. And then she started feeling guilty. She started thinking, wait a minute. We're praying for somebody to die in order for my husband to live. This just doesn't seem right. So she took it to the Lord in prayer. And she sat down and she had a conversation in prayer with God. And she said, God, I don't want somebody to have to die for my husband to live. I just want my husband healed, absolutely healed. And so she prayed that for a while. And then she said, well, you know, God, I know that you're going to answer my prayer because I do have faith, but I just would like to have a little sign. If you could make it snow, in McAllen, Texas, on Christmas Day. That, that would just be a, a nice little confirmation for me. Well, she told a couple of people, and they rolled their eyes. One of them was a guy who went to kindergarten with her and her husband, and he was kind of a straight shooter, and he said, Tony, you've lived here all your life in McAllen, Texas. Have you ever seen snow? She shook her head, no. He said, you know why? We haven't had snow in 109 years. That's, that's an impossible prayer. And she said, well, I'm confident God is listening to me. And she stayed confident. She stayed filled with faith. She stayed filled with faith on Christmas Eve. And she stayed full of faith on Christmas Eve later as it moved toward midnight. And at 11.59, we were talking about this, not in the first hour, but in the last of that last hour, she looked out the backyard and the snow was falling. The snow was falling in McAllen, Texas. Her rose bushes were all covered with snow. I did this story on the Today Show, and it, it is so beautiful to see those rose bushes with the, with the roses with snow on them. But even more beautiful was the shot that her daughter took of Tony out there, her black hair, looking up, saying, thank you, and her hair filled with white speckles. And she knew that she had her confirmation. 
three, oh, and the next day, everybody was joyful. The newspaper ran a headline, first white Christmas in the history of McAllen, Texas. Nobody knew it was Tony over there praying for God to, to deliver snow. But the confirmation that connected to the prayer and her husband's help took place three weeks later when they went up to McAllen, went up to uh, Houston again. And at the DeBakey Institute, the doctor ran him through all the tests. Then he sat there and he said, Tony, I can't explain this, but you're going to live a long life. Your heart is now within normal range. And I have the EF factors that they use, ejection fraction from before and after. And I can show those to people when I go on the television shows and so forth. And it was an absolute miracle. Now, talk about faith, prayer, producing an outcome that was desired. And that was the connection to prayer. Maybe the best story we have uh, about that. Yeah, that that is, you tell it so well. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I read it, but it was, it's pretty dramatic um, and pretty clear and powerful. Uh, you also have run into the question of when prayer does not work. Um, what, what about those situations? Well, I think every prayer is answered. <laughs> Not in the way you want it to. <laughs> That's right. It's either yes, no, not now. And when you think about it, that takes us back to our childhood, doesn't it? We can remember looking up and saying, Dad, can I go and get a bike? Or can I go buy a baseball mitt? Or can I go fishing? It's either yes no, or not right now. And, um, and so often we, uh, we judge the divine source before the divine source can get things in order. I mean, my wonderful wife uh, tells a story about when she was a kid growing up and she was very, very shy. And, um, and, and, and she always, uh, in fact, she had a, her, my mother-in-law was very oppressive. <laughs> um, she's gone to heaven now after 101 years to so see, and she's not living upstairs anymore. So this is the first time I've been able to say that, but uh, she had two children, one of whom became a stutterer. That was my wife's brother. And my wife escaped into other personalities. She would imitate the teacher. She would imitate the, the crossing guard and so forth. And she found out that when she would imitate these people, she could go into them. And it wasn't her now. Now it wasn't Louise Duarte. It was the crossing guard. And she could be a little more lively and, and out of her character, out of her comfort zone, because she was actually somebody else. So then she started doing Joan Rivers and Cher and, and George Burns and all of these other characters. And, and she would do it for the coffee clatch. And, uh, and she grew up and had a, had a family and so on and so forth. And she, she realized that she actually had a capability to make, uh, to, to, um, to, um, uh, to imitate people. And so um, when she did that, I forgot where I went, what was our original point on that? I, I'm going off into her career there. And uh, we were talking about how prayer. Uh, in prayer. It, there was a, you were, we were talking about prayer that does not work somehow because it's not ready. Oh, that it's, yeah, that it's something. That, and so she prayed that she prayed that she could, and she, her favorite show was the Carol Burnett show. And she, she just loved Carol Burnett and Tim Conway and Harvey Corman. And, um, and so she prayed that one day she could grow up in, and meet Carol Burnett. And here's how it happened. She tells the story that her mother would give her a quarter to go to the Catholic church. I don't know whether it was weekly or whatever it was to say a prayer. And so, uh, and I, I wasn't Catholic, so I didn't know this experience, but, but she said that she had a, she got a, she figured one prayer was a quarter's worth. 
And so she could get to the Catholic church. She'd put the quarter in the, in the box, take the candle and utter a prayer. Well, her mother told her to pray for the souls in purgatory. She had no idea who the heck those people were, but she would always say, please, God, can I just meet Carol Burnett? I want to meet Carol Burnett and Tim and Harvey. And so that was a little girl's prayer for a quarter. And uh, it was uttered. It was just out there. It was in the, in the ethernet. It was 20 years later that she was imitating Carol Burnett and uh, somebody saw the tape and they, who knew Carol Burnett and gave that tape to Carol Burnett and Carol Burnett thought it was funny and called up Louise and said, I'd like to meet you and invited her to come over to the Disney studio and to, um, to meet her. And so there was a little girl's dream. Prayer. Dream come and true. Her right? dream that was come answered. True. And uh, but it wasn't finished. It was another five or six years after that that she got a call out of the blue. It was Tim Conway. Somebody had sent him her audio tape or her videotape, and it was on a pile of videotapes. It just happened to be the one that was right on top. And he was looking for somebody to go on the road with him and Tim Car uh, uh, Harvey Corman so that they could do um, a, uh, a live show. And they were looking for somebody that could come in and out of the sketches and so forth and be in some of the sketches. Took the first tape, put it in the machine. It was Louise Duarte. He said, hey, hey, Charlene, his wife, come here. She came in and she looked at it and she said, what do you think of this girl? She said, I think you should, you should hire her. No, they hired her. That was the first tape, the last tape that he looked at. And that was Louise. And her prayer was answered. And that's a beautiful story. And I think Louise is bouncing around your house, getting ready, <laughs> getting ready I to can go. I see her back there as, right now. She's as we were talking around. about. Hey, Louise. Yes. Hey, Louise. Hey. <laughs> well, get, well, I'm getting ready to let him go. Guess who we were just talking about? Oh, yeah. Was it moi? Yes, it was. You and Carol Burnett and all the rest what? of the crew. <laughs> <laughs> Love Carol. Yeah. Well, we, we, your husband and I have had a wonderful time here, and it's so fun to see the inner, the interconnectedness between what Squire has been doing and with your help. I know it's a lot with your help. Of I can, I, can yeah. I know that. And to be able to get ideas out that overlap with mine. And he's such a student of the process. Uh, and I have been too. And to see the overlaps with different explanatory models, yes, but they're the overlap. And uh, it's all for me to try to get to understand the mind of God. But I'm more working down on the kind of little detail things about how it ha might happen here. But there's something else going on around here. You guys have tuned into it. And our audience is going to love this. And I very much appreciate being able to talk with with you squire and with your your lovely carol burnett or whoever <laughs> she, whoever she is right now whoever i whomever i woke up next to whoever this morning, you woke up know. next to yeah. and i do hope we'll be able to find a way for you to help me get my message out since you are out there on a big platform and i'm not and i got some ideas that i think would be helpful and complementary to yours so i thank you very very much for Finally, being able to have a conversation with you because I it was admired your, Bernie. Yeah, you're yeah. you're you're welcome. I've admired your stories for a long time, and I, I wish you Godspeed. Thank you so much. God bless All you. Right. You take care. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks much. This psychosphere is a mental atmosphere. Like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.